Welcome everyone to Next Practices Weekly from I4CP. Great to see so many returning names and faces uh, to the audience today. We've got a great guest. Um, we meet every Thursday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific for this Next Practices Weekly series. Uh, Want to welcome everyone. Uh, if, if it's your first time, I know some of you have come dozens of times. We've been running these really since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, if you're new to I4CP, we are a human capital research firm. We discover the people practices that truly drive high performance. Uh, we do that uh, through our research studies, through all the connections we provide to our member organizations, through interviews and, and case studies. Uh, we like to focus in on high performance organizations and what they're doing differently with their people practices. We mean What we mean by high performance is those organizations that excel in these four areas, revenue growth, market share, profitability, and customer satisfaction. And when we do our surveys, we like to tease out those practices uh, that sort of ones that the, maybe the top quartile of organizations do far more often than low performing companies, that bottom quartile, and then tease out insights uh, that we can share with our member companies and with all of you and the, the broader public as well. I mentioned members, a special and uh, welcome to everyone who's on the call from one of our member organizations. You see here just a small sample of our hundreds of, of member companies. They range from really large companies like Amazon, Microsoft, 3M, Accenture, and others, uh, to some smaller organizations, including a growing cohort of startups and unicorn companies. They also span across all industry verticals from manufacturing to retail to high tech, banking, fine, uh, healthcare, really uh, every industry represented, and increasingly more and more organizations that are global in nature, either headquartered outside the United States or headquartered here in the US, um, but with major operations overseas. My name's Tom Stone. I'm a senior research analyst here at I4CP. I co-host most of these sessions each week. And this week I'm joined by our chief research officer, Mr. Kevin Martin. Good morning, Kevin. Tom, good day to you and to everyone else. Good to have you with us. And I know you're gonna facilitate the conversation with our special guest who we'll introduce in just a few minutes, but I've got a few more quick reminders and announcements to share with folks. As I said, this is I4CP's Next Practices Weekly Call Series, meaning we, we meet every Thursday. You see some of the upcoming dates here on the right. On the 19th, we'll have our own Rob Cross, Senior Vice President of Research, joining us to talk about the powerful importance of transitions and uh, new employees and how to get them up to speed and more productive quicker. Then on the 26th, we've got Andre Martin, who's been a talent management uh, executive at a host of companies, all of which you would recognize. And he's an author of, of a new book as well. So we'll be learning uh, some of his latest insights on the 26th. In between there, we do have a, a growing series of sessions that are on different days. So not on Thursday typically, and also at different times. And that's to accommodate folks that are either in the APAC region or the EMEA region. Uh, we'll have Catherine Brecken, a uh, fellow senior research analyst of mine here at I4CP, uh, talking about culture and, and other topics on the 24th. You can find all of the dates and times for all of these sessions and more uh, up at our website, i4cp.com. A couple of other quick announcements. Our latest major study was on the role of AI and HR. We've got a public webinar coming up on October 24th, where Kevin Martin and Catherine Brecken will be co-presenting uh, some of the key findings from that, uh, sort of titled, Is HR Already Behind in the AI Revolution? I think a lot of functional areas and businesses are behind, particularly when it comes to generative AI, and that's certainly what our study found. Um, great data there. I've, I've been presenting on this myself to some of our member companies already, um, and so this will be a great reveal for, for the broader audience. Also, we have an annual conference that we call Next Practices Now that we hold uh, each March in Scottsdale, Arizona at the, at the beautiful Fairmont Princess property. Um, you can learn more about this conference uh, on the website, i4cp.com forward slash conference. You see here uh, a great lineup of speakers. We've been unveiling this week by week as we sign on more speakers. They range from CHROs and even CEOs from many organizations you'd recognize. We've got thought leaders and book authors. 
Um, we've just got a great, great range and great diversity of, of uh, speakers at this event. This event is special too, in that there are no vendors. We don't have a trade show. There's no expo, no one hitting you up in the hallways for sales conversations like that. Uh, it's meant for HR leaders to just be able to uh, commune with each other, uh, have some some great food, some great sessions, uh, learn learn from each other and learn from the speakers. So if you've never been to this conference, I'd highly encourage you to look into it. Uh, maybe consider bringing some of your your up and coming uh, leaders on your team. We we see that a lot with some of our member companies. So again, i4cp.com forward slash conference to learn more. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Kevin Martin, my co-host today to introduce our speaker and help facilitate today's conversation. Hey, thanks so much, Tom. And thank you, Zeta, for everything. And Brian, man, I'm telling you, I mentioned it before, I couldn't wait to have this conversation with you. You've got such a fascinating background and Taneo is a particular company that I've been tracking for a while and I really respect what the company does. Um, but your background is uh, impressive, very impressive. The companies you've been with from Aon Hewitt to Walmart, WPP, I mean, I can go on and on. I think even the Accenture is in there as well. And now you're the CPO at Taneo. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? What led you down this track um, as well? Great. Um, first off, I just want to thank you all for being here. Um, and thank you to you, um, Tom, Kevin, Zeta. Um, uh, it's a real priv privilege to be a part of this community. Um, I4CP has been instrumental in my first 13 months at Taneo. You've been a great partner to us. And particular shout out to Janelle, who does a great job keeping us updated on all you have to offer. We we absolutely adore her as a partner. So um, so let's hop in. You know, I I sort of could, because Taylor Swift is so popular right now, I, I could sort of like talk about my career in the eras I've had, um, because it's been really interesting. And I think the first, the first thing I would say is, uh, you know, I didn't set out to be here. Um, in this role. It wasn't really an aspiration I had. And anybody who went to college with me could perhaps remember that I had um, some snarky comments about how viable HR really was in some of those courses. But here I am today paying for that. Um, you know, um, I talk about my career as that I've spent um, about half of it um, helping organizations change and grow. Um, um, as a, a consultant and an advisor. And then I've spent the other half doing that um, and, and really living that purpose on the inside as uh, an employee and as a leader. Um, and that I think is really sort of, it's really shaped and informed how I approach the work. Um, and frankly, it really is an ethos around how I see the possibility and, and frankly, the potential of the craft and the work that we all do and care about. Um, so you're right. I spent the first decade of my career. I kind of go in reverse order. A lot of people moved around a lot when they were young and then sort of anchored later. I have a little bit of the opposite experience as sort of a productive disruptor, disruptor or as transformation agent. Um, the first decade of my career was it just a great American but global company, IBM. And I really think about that as where I learned to get things done. Um, I got to do that classic rotation across marketing, sales, professional services. I worked in corporate, so I moved to New York. Um, and I really, um, I really got a 360 degree view of a true global business and what that entails. And um, to everyone who has interns or started as an intern, I literally started at IBM as a co-op from Northeastern University at the age of 20. And I didn't leave for 10 years is sort of what I joke about. Um, from then on, I worked in professional services, which you know I think of as my resiliency era. Um, credit crisis. I was at Lehman Brothers um, at the crash of Lehman. Um, and being in HR um, during that was really a formative experience. Um, there's no way to appreciate resiliency and that kind of challenge and frankly trauma uh, at the time. But um, it's something I've really carried with me. And I often say to people, 
Um, nobody teaches you how to shut something down. Um, and so it was a really interesting era, if you will. From there, um, I started my professional services career at Aon, which became Aon Hewitt, um, a company that I just have tremendous respect and gratitude for, um, really helping large organizations shape their human capital and their talent and people strategies as social media and I think innovation really became both a disruptor and an opportunity. From there on, um, I went to Accenture where frankly, I feel like I did some of the best work of my life in professional services. I had the chance to work on a number of really major business transformations, working on the core of the people and capability agenda as part of that, found my way to Walmart, who I was actually working on serving as a client and then got pulled onto the inside. Um, and, you know, Walmart is such a fascinating experience because you really learn how to work at scale. And it's the gift of, of that experience has paid in so many different ways. Um, just really an iconic um, experience and body of work to get to do to help that company become a digital company. Um, and from there, um, back into professional services at Mercer, uh, loved working with a number of clients, found my way to WPP, uh, the largest creative marketing services company in the world. Um, and that's really where um, I think uh, I was truly um, I think, grown and developed to be ready for this role. Um, I had this really interesting, unique role where I worked through uh, essentially our biggest client uh, bodies where we had multiple agencies all coming together to serve that client. So my role was chief people officer for global clients. I also helped lead um, the relationship with the Coca-Cola company, which was at that point the largest advertising and marketing services deal in the world ever. Um, just a really great experience. And then I found my way to Teneo. Um, and I will, you know, as I turn it back to you, Kevin, what I really, really like about this opportunity is understanding the mindset and the situation of an advisor, understanding professional services, having had to have a team, grow a team, lead and run a PL myself in the background. It was just a really nice mix of how my experience, my desire, and what I wanted to do now all come together into a single way to harness that energy and, and experience. And, and Brian, it's so interesting listening to what you just outlined there. And um, in a minute, uh, folks, I'm gonna, uh, Brian's going to tell us about Taneo, but Brian, I, I'm going to go, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to go a little bit tangential here for a moment. I just, your background is so interesting in that you have experience, you've had customer facing roles, you've had business advisory roles, you've had, you know, HR type roles. And, you know, given that, does that shape, just out of your curiosity, does that shape the experiences you are looking for when you bring people into HR at Teneo and or the development opportunities that you're trying to present to your existing team? And then we'll get into Teneo. I, I was just curious. Yeah, it absolutely does. I think, you know, the, the one thing I look for um, is not so much um, my profile, um, because I find that to be um, a barrier to inclusion and innovation. But what I do look for is adaptability. It's really important when I think about my team and what we need to do. Um, it's really important that um, we'll, we have people who bring an expertise and a set of experiences and skills. And by the way, you know, you'll hear me talk about um, you can't isolate skills and uh, itself. It has to be about skills, experiences, and behaviors. So number one, I look for the combination of those things, but I also look at the adaptability of people. Um, professional services is a fast moving, fast changing. Um, in many cases, our organization, the work we do sometimes intersects with crisis. So it's really important that that nimbleness, that agility, the adaptability all be able to come through. And it's absolutely something I look for when I um, look at either who we select or who we grow on the team. Yeah. So let's thank you for that. And and, and, and can you tell everyone about Taneo? Because you know, I can only imagine with him just looking at uh, 
the craziness and the, the unfortunate horrific situations over the weekend, let's say, um, in the Middle East. And you might even have clients that you're advising over there, you know, and companies there or CEOs that have operations around the world. But can you tell us about the firm and the type of work that it does? Yeah, it's it's um, the world is complex and the world. Um, and I thank Bob Johansson for this uh, from the Institute for the Future. I thank him for teaching me this. Um, the days where we could work on certainty are over because there are no certainties anymore. All we can do is continuously strive and search for clarity. And what I think about Taneo, what's so amazing is we advise CEOs um, and leaders around um, how to navigate all the challenges around their business. And really, while we use the CEO advisory firm, our, our work really is about the CEO agenda. Sometimes that's with uh, the CFO and the CEO. Sometimes that's with the board. And sometimes it's with the chief people officer, officer the chief communications officer. So our work is, is really, um, we're a network of uh, senior experts and advisors who um, really come together to offer unparalleled distinctive advice for our clients as they navigate their business landscape, um, the global backdrop of um, situations, happenings, um, currencies, all sorts of things. And then, you know, it's best to think about us um, as having sort of five core businesses strategy and communications, which is sort of our core business, financial advisory, which is also one of our larger businesses, um, a management consulting business and capability, risk advisory, and finally people advisory as well. And together, those five work together to do what we say, uh, which is partnering with clients to do great things for a better future. And um, as you can see, uh, in this slide, um, people are often surprised by how global we are. And I think that to me, that's a, a real value proposition for us to be able to work across our organization and our experts, tap into our senior advisors, which range from um, former senators of the U.S. government, um, uh, government leaders of uh, other countries, all the way to former CEOs um, and being able to tack in, tap into that advisory capability to serve our clients, no matter, um, no matter what they're looking at across the CEO agenda. You know, one of the things you, had, you were talking about, and I, I love how you were, you know, pulling in Bob Johansson and his guidance to you. And you were saying, Hey, all we can really do is provide clarity. And I mean, it is simplification, right? And clarity in this era of continuous disruption, you cannot put a premium high enough on that. And, and, and I mean this when I say this, when I was looking at this slide initially, I didn't know, I didn't anticipate you were talking about clarity, but I love how you disaggregate. You actually make clear what you're talking about here in the ambition, where it's like grow. Well, what do we mean by that? Well, it's purposeful development. I'm sure you could double click on that and people make sure they understand what that means in that regard. Can you talk to us about this, your yeah. people ambition? Yeah, when, when I got to Taneo, I found an organization that wasn't lacking in expertise, but we did need to professionalize our people function. And one of the things that became clear is we didn't have a unifying sort of purpose, if you will, around the people part of our business. Our business has a really strong purpose. We have really strong leaders. We have so many examples of work we do with CEOs and famous business leaders around the world, but we needed, um, I think, a simple but clear way to start to bring together the work we would and will do in the people function uh, to enable our people strategy. And so we work together and, and really, um, you know, I have the I have the great benefit of working with a boss as a CEO who's incredibly good at strategy. So I was really able to look at um, a statement that exists around our company ambition that looks very much like this. And then really, um, I think, have it inform our people ambition, which is to grow a pipeline of diverse advisors who create a better future. And you're right, Kevin, that is about clicking into 
really purposeful development. And, and I'll talk a little bit about what's unique and different about our company when we when we think about growth and development and learning. Um, but we really need to make sure that that growth anchors around delivering skills, experiences, and behaviors of sought after expertise. And this point about being sought after is really, really critical because it's what makes us distinctive from other professional services organizations. And then finally, I think the point you're picking up on, clarity, resiliency, adaptability, is the is our people being able to identify, adapt to, and navigate what matters most to organizations, stakeholders, and leaders. And so that's how we think about, it's sort of our North Star, it's our purpose as a people team. And it's something we're gonna continuously strive for. It's not, um, it's not a property, it's a process that is continuous for us. Yeah, it just, you know, it just what it reminds me of is, um, and I'm sorry about this, but I just, my mind works in a lot of weird ways and sometimes I'll just share it, but you know, one I of the, so. <laughs> they were great together on this, but Brian, you know, one of the things that I think is really going to distinguish it's, it's incumbent upon any HR leader or, or HR leader that's supporting a business line, or frankly, it's even above that, especially when you're in the people business and who isn't anymore, but your people are your product in this regard and, and your advisors, et cetera. But it's critical to how do you help people make tangible the critical intangibles. And it's the intangibles that, you know, whether it's the company's culture, whether it's its brand, whether it's the knowledge that's inside someone's head that, you know, people say, I think I want that, right? But what does that look like? What is that, what, how do you experience that, right? And so I'm just, when I hear you talk, I, I'm sensing that's a, probably a, a, an underlying message that you're following through as well about making tangible, those critical intangibles. Yeah, you're, you're exactly right. And I would, I would play back to you um, what it means to be an advisor. And if you think about that word, it implies trust. It implies reliability. It implies um, resilience. So there is a lot behind that that is intangible. Um, but is absolutely in a time of need, super critical and almost invaluable. And so having the trust of the CEO, having the trust of who it takes to deliver on the CEO agenda is really, really critical. And as you can imagine, it plays really nicely into this slide because we, um, while we have um, uh, you know, what I would call um, the composition of a traditional workforce, we don't have sort of a traditional pyramid model. We're a really senior led firm. As you can imagine, we have to be to have the kind of um, capacity of expertise, to have that inventory, if you will. Um, it means something different around what your workforce population looks like. But it also means something incredibly opportunistic about the kind of career you can have. And really not having to reach a certain point, if you will, because with you, with the right expertise, the right skills, the right experiences and the right behaviors, you can have a really long career giving advice when you're trusted, reliable, resilient, those kinds of things. And so it's a really nice segue into our people strategy, which is all about thinking about careers for an organization like us not feeling like we have to copy every other organization, but really thinking through pathways, rotations. And when I think about the, the collision between a senior led company and those skills and expertise and the opportunity to work on new or different work, we have the ability to step back, step back and say, who wants to work on a turnaround? Who wants to work on opening in a new market? Who wants to work on other things like that that are um, maybe not as traditional and a true matriculation that you might have in another organization? So I see our ability to offer careers as a complete differentiator and totally opportunistic. Um, capabilities, um, as you said, our people are our product. And um, we have such rich expertise that we have um, 
a, a, I think a huge opportunity around instilling capabilities in sort of a greenhouse effect within the firm. So our senior leaders building our next senior leaders, which is something um, we've proven out in our SMD accelerator program. But we have a, a rich opportunity to say, these are what organizations need as advice. And that's where we're going to put our investment and in how we grow and mature our capabilities in those areas. And then obviously culture, everybody talks about culture, everybody cares about culture. Um, we want a collaborative, inclusive culture. It's really important to our business strategy. And so we're spending a lot of time being specific about what collaboration means and what we expect. And then finally, um, nail the fundamentals. And I have a really unique opportunistic situation in that a lot of people in our function are ripping things out. Um, as a relatively newer company, we spend our time thinking about the bets we make on the fundamentals or the, the foundations of the people function, technology as an enabler, data as an enabler. We spend time thinking about how we leapfrog and get ahead. Uh, Brian, you, you mentioned uh, the SMD Accelerator program, so I would just like to, to not let that slip by. Can you tell us more about that program? You dropped that name. Can you tell us more about that program, including what, what its impacts have been? Yeah, I'm I'm really I'm, first off I'm um I'm really proud of this. Um it was um a, an idea driven by one of our business leaders um Dan Butters who I respect tremendously and we were looking through our promotion process last year and it was obvious that we had an opportunity as we dig deeper and invest in the concept of capabilities. We have this opportunity to say, well, how do we make it very clear that if you move from MD to SMD, which is our highest level in our architecture, what's different? What's now new? What's expected of you? And how can we accelerate the enablement of you being able to deliver on that? And so we brought together around 20 newly promoted SMDs in the beginning of Q2 of this year. And it was a moment for us to really step back. And, and it was a design opportunity is what I call it. So when we think about the kinds of profiles, skills, experiences, behaviors, again, the profiles we were building toward at that level, we really started from scratch around how could we create a boot camp like experience that really enabled them quickly uh, on their own individual growth paths that involved our senior people building the next generation of our senior people, and then integrated these often critical but sometimes separate conversations and capabilities like well-being, mental health, inclusion. And I'm a I'm a I'm a firm believer that when we have conversations off to the side, like one of the things I found in my HR career and even in my consulting career is that we talk about one thing in one corner, one thing in one corner, one thing in another corner. And as the human, it, it that's not actually how it plays out. They're all integrated. And so we had a moment to step back and integrate to deliver an experience that quite frankly built the leaders we need for the future. And so over two and a half days, we were able to, um, I think what I would say, deliver on that experience. And what I'm really proud of, um, and, and you'll see that this is a little bit of my data chops playing out, is we began with the end in mind and with measurement as sort of our single point of truth around effectiveness. 95% um, of the program felt um, that they had been accelerated into the SMD role. 97% um, rated it as very effective. We have an NPS of nine out of 10. We were super clear about um, which sessions were most impactful. So we understand that and know why. And then finally, um, we, we put a business metric on that in that we were able to track um, opportunities in our business development pipeline that came as a result of these individuals from all around the world getting together to talk about where they might have been working on similar opportunities or in some cases similar clients that now can be made strengthened or made better because they knew each other and were collaborating. What was interesting about 
the design of this is it was clear we wanted to do this for our newly promoted SMDs, but we had an acquisition in Q1 of Tolkien in the United Kingdom, um, which is part of our strategy and communications um, business unit. And um, we were able to include those um, those who crosswalked over to Teneo at the similar um, at the similar level. And then we also piloted out of our management consulting business, new hires at the SMD level, which we don't have a lot of, but what was really great about this is it was, we stayed true to our core, but we also used it as some innovation opportunity around our M&A behavior um, and our accelerated integration of Tolkien. And then also to test and see as a potential approach for onboarding senior talent to the organization as well. And I think those experiments played out really well for us. Um, the thesis is that um, we um, contribute to our culture by investing in our senior people, that they'll be stronger leaders with the right commercial capabilities, but also the right people leadership capabilities, that they will bring a more holistic view to what they lead us through and how they do it by understanding concepts around the need for mental health and well-being, around their role in DE&I, and most importantly, that inclusion is a skill. And then I think finally that this was also commercial. It wasn't an HR program. The genesis of this came from the business and we were we were really, really clear and determined to have that business um, as a layer throughout. Um, and finally, I'll have to say for me professionally, it was also pretty awesome because Ursula Burns and I, Ursula Burns, uh, many of you probably recognize as the former CEO of Xerox, but Ursula and I kicked it off um, and, and really gave um, what I think of as some um, pointed, clear, but um, I would say um, pointed, clear, but maybe direct messaging around expectations at this level. And it was really nice as a way to take somebody who's had so much rich experience and, again, incorporate them as part of that experience and curriculum. You know, Brian, I mean, you hit upon so many nuggets there that we could, it would be so great to double click on a lot of these, but, you know, a couple of things that come to mind, you know, what I'm hearing from you, and we've been seeing this in our research, and we think this is an absolute imperative next practice that companies actually take action on coming up, which is um, holding people leaders, training them to do it, but then holding them accountable for not just the business oriented outcomes, but employee oriented outcomes. And that could include well being, of course, engagement, attrition, inclusion. But you've got, in order to do that, you have to build the capability up so they know what they're doing in that regard. And you guys, as part of this yeah. SMD accelerator, I understand we're yeah. kind of creating leaders to be almost lifeguards yeah. in that regard, right? Yeah. And you can talk about that in just a moment. Um, but also, you and Ursula chaired the Inclusion Culture Council, and now you're demystifying what that is, getting back to making tangible the critical intangibles. Here's what it looks like. Here's what it looks like in action. We expect this of you, the accountability piece. Can you just kind of fold all of that together and telling us where you're at and where you think it's aspiring to go to? Yeah, um, uh, there, there's a lot in there. Let me, um, let me just like just hit the strongly agree button because... I think the magic of the SMD Accelerator was in smart, relevant, business-centric design. It was a design opportunity. And I often feel like HR work is over-programmed and under-outcomed. Um, and it's something I talk about a lot in rooms with other CHROs or CPOs. Um, and, and, and we tried to make sure that we didn't fall into that trap. Also, um, I have an incredible team who just did a really, really fantastic job thinking about what each individual participant could and should do upon self-reflection before coming together in New York for this, um, for this experience. And then the work and the extension, the long tail of commitment stayed through also in the design. So um, we have people continuing to work on their development plans. We assigned 
um, at our GEC, our leadership level, we assigned buddies to every participant and they meet and operate as coaches um, inside the organization. And so really thinking about the elasticity of this experience has been important to it. Um, you touched on um, leaders as lifeguards, and it's a little bit of something I've I've been thinking about and I think my own personal experience in many ways where I've been developing and where I needed help developing, um, but also in that complexity and challenge and just frankly, sometimes the really difficult realities we live with in today's world. Um, you know, I, I think of the lifeguard as a metaphor and, and some of this is driven because I wanna agitate this skills oriented emphasis. And it's not because I don't believe in it or a hundred percent support it, but we have to also like skills is one dimension and we need to actually be able to see skills play out inside of scenarios. So having a skill and deploying that skill effectively are different things. And when I think about leaders as lifeguards, I think about the lifeguard as the analogy, um, number one, because whether you're on a beach club in Mykonos, um, a beach somewhere else, or a pool outside of Chicago, that symbolism of what that role is, is pretty consistent. So it plays globally, but a lifeguard is there to, in many ways, welcome people and to let people know that you can come and convene here and that there is safety. Um, also, a lifeguard really operates that when they spot maybe behavior or actions that um, have some level of um, inappropriate risk, they try to mitigate or shut that down. Um, and then there are the other places that I think um, are more action oriented, which are um, spotting people who are at risk or in danger. And then ultimately knowing that person is certified and sometimes has to dive in and save someone. And I think our leaders, as we think about hybrid, as we think about health and well being, as we think about inclusion, and, you know, as we think about everything from this weekend to the war in Ukraine and all that our people, maybe you know, your dog died and it's a really hard day, your kids are sick and you're having to juggle lots of things. We need leaders who actually can spot the right challenges and handle them in the right way, even if that means diving in to save someone. And, and Brian, can you just, I mean, this is a this, the leader's role has become so complex, just like HR has become so complex. And so, can you simplify something for us? What is an example of a leader? If you're my leader and I'm on a team and you and I are, you know, we're having our, our interfaces, what is one thing? Can you share with me what you've been trained on to spot something in me that would say, you know what, warning flag here? Yeah, I, first off, I think um, if given the opportunity um, and if somebody isn't participating and you've given them an opportunity to do it across a number of different ways, which may they may feel comfortable in. So in public, not in public, et cetera. So just a, um, a lack of engagement, whether it be over email, maybe phone, maybe WhatsApp, maybe in group meetings. If somebody's not engaging, um, to me, that's something I look for and I ask why. Um, I think I'll answer this in a second way and invert this. Um, another thing I look for in leaders that may be driving this is what I see as, and, and have really been studying as the rise of micromanaging. And I think leaders lacking the full tools and capabilities of leading in a hybrid world have somewhat shifted to micromanaging people. And that's creating um, a lot of challenge for employees. And we need to rethink um, the role of the leader in any environment, but in a hybrid environment, not only do the role, do the, does the role of the leader need to be somewhat rethought or reimagined, but the skills, experiences, and behaviors required to do it effectively um, need recast. And, and that, uh... 
I'm just saying this from a research perspective. Everything you're saying, you're you're sensing and saying and, and pursuing, Brian, is exactly what we're seeing in our research. And you know, Zeta, if you get a chance, there might even be an infographic around 14 future leader capabilities. And one of the things that we called out there is just, you know, we talk about the leader around, you know, well-being. And you've got it's to your point. It's sensing and seeing, but knowing how to respond appropriately. And Brian, what I'm sensing from you is, again, going back to demystifying. If you're providing clarity to a leader, hey, this is important and this is what to look for. And, and if you see this, this is what to do, right? I mean, I really appreciate the clarity that I'm hearing you be able to provide to your leaders. And, and let's switch here for a minute, because I think you're also doing this in this regard, which we think is great. We just conducted a very significant study on generative AI and HR. We called it, Is HR Behind in the AI uh, Revolution? And what I love is your AI 101 that you're providing right now. Can you give us a bit of a sense as to what that is and how that is you know, providing more clarity to your leaders as well around a critical topic. Yeah, we've um, we've shared this concept with our leaders. It's about to roll out this quarter, and I'm really excited about it. And and I think I'll give a perspective that um, starts with something pe people may not um, expect. Um, so um, I. Can I think about this as separating the technology because there's going to be all sorts of other new technologies. It's really about the humanity and the human that we need to think through. So AI 101 was really has its genesis in inclusion. And in an organization like ours, where there's a lot of deep expertise, my team and I thought about how can we create a unifying safe to the ego, easy way to get everybody at the same starting line together around Gen AI and what it means for the work we do for our clients, what our clients may be wanting, needing, asking, experimenting with and expecting, and how do we create in sort of an academy-like way something all of us can go through as an organization that creates a common experience, a common baseline of knowledge, and I think um, intellect, and then finally also gives us a common language around something that's so new and so being talked about. And so um, our, our um, AI 101 approach really started with inclusion. Secondly, it's about like, how do we think about building capability at scale? And then I think too, um, something that's gonna make this, um, I hope an effective growth opportunity for our people is that this wasn't a people team only driven thing. We're actually pulling and working with partners and um, our senior business people who are experts in this work. They've co-created this with us. So all automatically, um, when we go to scale this across the entire organization, it'll have that credibility because as an organization that works on advising CEOs and the CEO agenda, we've baked that into what we're actually doing for our people. And that's a real unique opportunity we have that I feel shame on us if we don't use and exploit that effectively. And then finally, you know, I've said to my team, and, and this is something I've said and, and really learned from in my own, I think, growth around helping company, companies become more digital, is it doesn't have to be an iPhone 15. If it's an iPhone 3, and then we make it an iPhone 5, and then we get to an iPhone 7, as long as we're growing, iterating, and continuing to improve it, we're going to make our people better at the advice they give to our clients, and our people are going to give us advice about how we need to continue to develop to grow them. And, and you know, one of the things, just talking about the people leader and the capability, you've talked um, about... Um, um, you know, getting your people leaders to, to quote unquote, get fluent in data. And, you know, can you just talk to us about that? I think, I think everyone probably can resonate with that, but what does that mean at your firm and what are you doing about it? 
Yeah, I have a I have a broad view of this that I've seen across my experiences serving clients and then working internally. So this is an amalgamation and, and it's back to skills, experiences and behaviors. So one of the traps is actually a lot of HR organizations are not very fluent in data. They um, they aren't grown or necessarily fully skilled in reporting data insights, action, and that sort of what I think of as value chain around actually how to put data to work. So there's a whole pillar of, I think, skills work that needs and can be done for HR around data as data that gets put to work. And then there's the experience of really doing that well, um, how you make a point, how you engage with the business, how you not squabble over the lowest common denominator of turning it into a cost discussion. And then finally, it's behavior. I take data to everything I can. Uh, when I talk to my boss or to my peers on the leadership, I'm always looking at um, the behavior of leading with data, exposing people to insights, engaging and sharing and co-owning actions as a result of what the insights tell us we need to work on. The, the secret too for HR is to not assume that the handoff and handshakes with the business, don't assume that those people are fluent in data either. And sometimes um, the challenge isn't actually HR, it's that the receiver doesn't have the fluency needed to actually put the data or the insight to work into a productive action and outcome. And then I'll end with something that I think was in a really healthy way imprinted in me um, by Jackie Canny, who I worked for when I was at Walmart. And that is the ability to move from an emphasis and focus on activities to outcomes. And it is through data that you can make that journey. Yeah, and we, we love Jackie, you know, <laughs> as well, and we get it. and. Um, just, you know, Brian, when you talk about it, it reminds me so much of a conversation the CEO of ANZ Bank shared with us uh, when we interviewed him as part of our organizational agility research. And he's based out of Australia. And he, he was saying, you know what, to us, it's about speed, speed from sensing to insight to action. And that yeah. sensing piece is what are you sensing internally from the data, right? Externally, what are you, what are you sensing from customer data? Um, social data, social sentiment, whatever it is, and converting that. When you think about the HR, for, for the HR leaders on this call here, because so many of them struggle with that piece and they want to really up the game of their teams in that area there. Is there one particular skill that you started with or, you know, because some people say, you know what, my team understands data, they understand it, they just can't convert that into an insight, or they get the insight, but they have a hard time articulating it in a in a story that actually doesn't sound HR-ish to a business leader, leader, and they focus on that. What would be your advice to the audience yeah. here? Yeah, I think um, we have a lot of plans in HR, um, and what what I constantly push on myself and my team because it's hard um, is actually to flip the bullet around from the activity to the outcome. And I'm telling you, when you can say, um, we're going to recruit this many people with this skill to, we'll increase our business this percentage because we have a full bench that we can cover more business development, win more work with this expertise. When you can make that flip, the conversation with the leader is just so much smoother. And you actually create, I think, rapid alignment in that. Um, and so that's, it, it's, it's a really, really, it's, it's a really hard skill and I'm still learning. Um, I mess up on it all the time. Um, I was on with my team this morning as we do our 2024 planning. And I said, you know, look, uh, that's great. It's, it's layer our work and our priorities are going to be layered across careers, capabilities, culture underlined with nail the fundamentals. But let's frame it. Let's not put what the action or the work is. Let's put what the outcome will be. Um, I love it. We're constantly working on it. And again, it's a process, not a property. I, 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 and that makes total sense. What I would say to the I4CP members on this call 
is we've got a framework that we use and many of our members use it, especially the heads of HR with their teams, where it starts with market performance or the business outcome at uh, whatever that business outcome might be. And there's a series of questions that allow you to link it back, you know, that link back to culture, to leadership, to talent that really you start with the outcome, you ask the right questions, and it really helps to create that story that, that I'm hearing you talk about, Brian. Um, so please contact your membership directors. We can help you with that. Um, you know, Brian, business driver for culture roadmap, you know, you're, you're, you know, can you talk about the culture roadmap? And I know we, we've got limited time here left, but this is a very important part that, uh, that you wanted to share here. And then we can maybe end with some CEO insights that you guys have that, uh, this audience could benefit from. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, First off, uh, um, and I'll close on a few, I'll close this slide with a few things that are inspiring me right now, but they all start with a belief that you have to make culture everyone's challenge and opportunity. I prefer to be optimistic and say opportunity, but everyone has to see themselves as accountable for creating and driving culture. And um, what we did is borrowed... Um, your research at I4CP. So um, this group was highly, highly influential in shaping how we approached it. And at our summit, it's our it's our annual gathering of our leaders, and then we do a lot of it virtually as well. But um, our our most senior people come to New York. Um, I had a panel with our business leaders, um, three different of our uh, business units, um, and myself talked through this uh, framework as our shared North Star. And these are what we call our healthy habits, again, based on a lot of your research, but you were really influential in recasting the expectation that our leaders care about our culture and show up visibly working on and through and with our people around culture. And we talk about things, well-being, inclusion, et cetera. Um, that we celebrate the right things, particularly when we win and when we work well together. We measure and reinforce. Um, I say all the time that I am accountable, just like our business has quarterly results. That's where the prowess around data, insights, and measurement on the people side come in as well. Um, we have a growth and expertise mindset. So what, you're not too senior to continue to grow. Um, and then we need to create multiple endless opportunities for more junior and newer people to our firm to grow as well. Um, we hold ourselves accountable for employee focused outcomes. And then finally, um, poor or uh, not acceptable behaviors addressed immediately and without exception. And this is also about transparency. And so, um, you know, below I4CP, some other research from Harvard, you all helped us think through this. And I have to say, one of the things that's, uh, there are two things that are inspiring me right now that I'm really excited to dig into. And one is a book um, that Francis Fry and Ann Morris have out around move fast and fix things. Um, I, I've been lucky enough to be um, a student of Francis Fry um, at a number of companies. And um, that work around how to galvanize a company, how to build trust and how to lead change through more trust uh, is really inspiring me. And then the second thing is um, a new book called Energy Rising. And it's by um, Dr. Du uh, Dr. Julia um, Dejanji. And it's really about the leader who thrives in high pressure pressure um, situations and circumstances. And I think those two things really speak to the business backdrop and landscape that we're in right now. And all that we can do as people leaders to create and build the capabilities to be ready for that and lay the foundation around the expectation and opportunity of our culture to enable and facilitate that um, those things are really important. You know, we're, we're, we're right up against our time limit here. And it's a perfect segue with what you just outlined. By the way, just, I'd be remiss if I didn't say this. 
And thank you. We, I didn't know you were going to do this, but thank you. Our, and for those of you who are not I4CP members, buy this book. Um, it outlines many of the steps that Brian's outlined here um, that they and uh, um, are using as part of their North Star. Brian, you guys have knowledge and insights into leading CEOs in their thinking. When can you share, perhaps, for this audience? Um, what do you what what's one or two nuggets that you'd like to plant in everyone's minds here that that CEOs are thinking about that heads of HR should be also thinking about if they're not all right now? Yeah. Yep. Um, I'm going to cite a few things from our uh, 2023 Global CEO and Investor Outlook Survey. Um, it's a body of work that we do with CEOs. You could see Paul Keery, my boss, our CEO, um, talking about it. Also, Ursula Burns. Um, two points that I would lead. First off, only 28% of CEOs indicate that their current executive teams really represent the perspectives of the future or future generations. And so that tells me that our leadership teams need more um, need more very diverse and inclusive perspectives um, and different generations and their voices and views as part of business strategy. And then secondly, um, investors want to see CEOs double the representation of voices in the next generation of today's C-suite. So a little bit of pressure coming in around um, who gets to lead, um, inclusion and representation and the diversity required to lead effectively uh, in today's environment if businesses want to grow and be successful. Thank you for sharing those, Brian. And thanks for all that you shared. I, this was, I, I was so looking forward to this and um, and I look forward to continuing the discussion and learning more about your journey. And we're really appreciative of you being an I4CP member. Um, Tom, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you. Yeah, great, great job, Kevin. And, and great job, Brian. Uh, thank you for sharing all that you did. Um, appreciate your time today. Appreciate everyone else also joining the call today and uh, participating over in the chat. And thank you, Zeta. Uh, you, I'm, I'm surprised you're able to grab them so quickly, but those book recommendations that came in at the end, thanks for putting those up there because I know a few people were asking for those. I will also note those in the uh, call notes uh, for those that maybe are new to the next practice weekly series. We do record these calls, make the recordings, the slides, and pretty extensive notes available up in our archive. So go check that out because there's been, we've had lots of great guests uh, week to week uh, and you can get caught up on some of the past sessions. The other thing to know about these uh, calls each week is that they do provide recertification credit hours for those of you that have an HRCI or a SHRM uh, certification as part of your HR journey. Uh, just jot down the relevant program ID or activity ID. I know it can be hard to get all the recertification hours in uh, uh, over time. So uh, these weekly sessions uh, can help you do that. Thanks again, Kevin. Thanks, Brian. Great session. Uh, thanks, Zeta. And uh, look forward to seeing everyone here again next week when we've got Rob Cross, our own Senior VP of Research, who will be joining us as the guest then. Until then, have a great rest of your week, everyone. Bye-bye now.